Proseguimos con la exposición. Right, we're going to continue with this panel. And next, we have Professor Neil O'Connell. He's a physiotherapist professor in Bruno University. And he's been dealing with the validation of clinical processes, uh, medicine based on evidence. Thank you. You have your floor. Hola. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I think this is a fantastic conference, genuinely. You go to pain conference after pain conference. It's so well organized. The content is fantastic. I apologize for the next 45 minutes where I might change that. But it's so nice to be here, and it's so nice to see physiotherapists really engaging in talking about pain. It's vital. But I'm not really going to talk much about pain. So I'm going to talk about effectiveness evidence. And I come at this from my role as a, an editor and a Cochrane reviewer for the Cochrane Pain Palliative and Supportive Care Group. And I know that Cochrane reviewers are not always the most popular people in a room full of medics and physios, because sometimes we say things that perhaps are uncomfortable. Um, but what I really want to do for you today is talk to you about some of the issues surrounding how we measure effectiveness uh, for our treatments in chronic pain, and uh, talk about some contemporary challenges and issues in that field. Maybe give you a few tips, maybe, about how you might look at evidence. And if I'm doing well for time, I might even do an honesty test with you all. So uh, I want you to start thinking about being really honest with me. Anyway, um, everyone is here because they know that chronic pain is a minefield. It's a minefield for the patient because the patient will go to a, a thousand different clinicians. They'll be given a thousand different explanations. They may negotiate their way through a maze of treatments. And the fascinating thing about those treatments is every single person pushing that treatment is passionate about it, genuinely believes it's effective, and will say it's evidence-based. Evidence-based. So if we didn't think it worked and if we didn't think it was evidence-based, what that would make us charlatans. So, and I don't think there are many charlatans in physiotherapy. Um, but it can't be that all of these therapies that we use are effective. So we need to negotiate that minefield. How many of you on Twitter? Put your hand up if you're on Twitter. Put your hand up if you're not on Twitter. Put your hand up if you didn't put your hand up. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter is a really interesting way of looking at how physiotherapists look at evidence for treatment effectiveness. Because the average Twitter discussion goes like this. Core stability is really important in back pain and it makes my patients better. Someone else will tweet, there's no evidence for core stability. Core stability is nonsense and it harms patients by making them worry about not moving their back. It works, it doesn't. Then there's a pause while the person who says it works searches PubMed. And they search PubMed, core stability works, fantastic. And they find a trial. They don't read the trial, except the conclusion of the abstract of the trial. And they link it, and there you are, they've won. Except the, the, the other person, they do the same thing, but they Google or PubMed, core stability, ineffective. And they find a trial, and they post a link, and they've won. The problem with both of those approaches is it's cherry picking. It's cherry picking only that evidence that supports your world view. It isn't mature debate, and it isn't a way for us to get to the heart of whether our treatments work. So we're not going to be cherry picking today. We're only going to go to Cochrane reviews, and I'll do all my cherry picking from Cochrane reviews. Because that's what Cochrane is all about. Cochrane is a non-profit organization, and what we try to do is use the most rigorous met methods to synthesize all of the best evidence that asks the question, does this treatment work? It's that simple. But in effectiveness research, in fact, in all research, but really in effectiveness research, we've been worshiping a false god for a long, long time. Anyone know what the false god might be? You've seen it. The p-value. <laughs> p is less than 0 0.05. My treatment works. That's a nonsense. It's never been true. P-values are important because they give us a measure of how confident we should be that any effect that we're looking at is actually real. 
But they don't tell us that a treatment works because it's perfectly possible to have a treatment that creates a statistically significant benefit that is utterly trivial to the patient. And, and so statistical significance on its own really doesn't tell us a great deal. So I want you to see past a p-value. And when you read a trial and all they present is the p-value and no actual differences on outcomes, no numerical outcomes, I would be suspicious of that trial because they're playing a game called selective outcome reporting. And that puts that trial at risk of bias. And we know that trials that don't report their outcomes tend to be at risk of bias. So if we're not thinking about p-values, what should we think about? So we, we've really got to think about, well, what size of effect is important to a patient, okay? What do patients want? Well, patients want a cure, but we all know that cures are hard to come by. In long-term condition, cures are generally not a realistic prospect. So the next question becomes, well, what would be the minimum size of effect for a patient to think that treatment was worthwhile? Because treatment represent an opportunity cost. If you're having a treatment, you're not doing something else that you might want to be doing. If you're having a treatment, it may be costing you money, or it may be costing the state money. If you're having a treatment that might benefit you, you're also engaging in a process that might harm you. So weighing all that up, we've got to ask, what is a treatment effect that is clinically important? And no one can agree on what that looks like. So the impact consensus group have come up with these guidelines that we're going to talk about, and then we're going to pick them apart a little bit. And the guidelines are that anything less than a 15% improvement in someone's pain is likely to be a trivial effect. Anything more than a 30% improvement in pain is a moderately important change. And anything, um, anything more than a 50% improvement in pain is a, is a substantially important change. So, are people happy with that? Does, that? does that look like a meaningful, legitimate approach for considering the size of effects? Put your hand up if it does. Put your hand up if that sounds reasonable. We've got to draw our lines in the sand somewhere. Put your hand up if you think it's unreasonable. Right, so now, all the room, put your hands up, because you didn't put your hands up. Anything less than a 15% change is probably not important. So, what do, these, what do these thresholds do for us? Well, they're, they're good, right? They shift our focus from statistical significance to the actual size of the benefit that the patient experiences. This is a good thing. But they're not intervention-specific. It's a generic cutoff. So if you were a patient, would you expect or demand the same minimal clinically important benefit for me to give you a copy of the back book as you would to allow me to implant electrodes in your spinal cord and give you a spinal cord stimulator or undergo lumbar fusion surgery, okay? So they're not intervention specific and that's a substantial problem for the construct of the impact clinical important differences. They're, they're generally not population specific. Uh, Manuela Ferreira and Rob Herbert recently did a review of all the different MKIDs that have been derived for MKIDs, sorry, minimal clinically important difference, sorry, or smallest worthwhile effect. Um, Manuela Ferreira's review showed that the majority of studies that took an approach to establishing a clinically important difference threshold didn't actually ask patients. So they, they did, looked at statistical distribution and they looked at the size of effect that we could detect, but a clinically important difference can only be derived from the patient perspective. So they're not population specific. And the other thing is, they're not based on the size of the treatment effect. They're based on how much better the patient gets. That's the patient's outcome, but it doesn't measure how much of an effect the treatment had, because people get better and pain changes, okay? So it has its strengths, but it has its weaknesses, because if we start with a patient at baseline, and then we follow them over time. We know that that change represents the natural history of the patient, what would have happened even if we hadn't done anything. All the non-specific treatment effects of seeing a patient and clinical theatre, placebo, and the specific effect of the treatment, presuming there is a specific effect of that treatment. Yeah? So that 
doesn't give us a clear reflection of how effective the, a treatment is, okay? The only measure that gives you the specific treatment effect in any clinical trial is the difference between the groups after treatment. So what I've done is I've gone to the Cochrane Library and I've tried to take the between group estimates of effect for a bunch of different treatments. And I've tried to see how much of a change they would be from the baseline measures of pain in those reviews, okay? So it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a manipulation, but it's just uh, instructive to have a look. And I've been a bit selective, I've cherry picked because I've only chosen treatments for where it looked like there was an effect. I've ignored all the treatments where there was no effect. So I'm giving you the, the best view from the Cochrane Library, the positive view. So if it's in the green there, okay, if we're in the green, we've got a substantially important effect, specific to the treatment. In the amber, it's a moderately important effect. In the red, it's a minimally important effect. And in the blue, uh, no win, okay? So having a look here, we have exercise versus no treatment, a minimally important effect, very imprecise though. Uh, tramadol and strong opioids, are you surprised about that? Huh? Uh, if you look at these benefits for a potentially very harmful agent, you know, do, do you think, uh, do you think they, the, the benefits really outweigh the risks? I think that, that's not something for me to decide, but it's something for people to talk about. Um, exercise versus another therapy. Manual therapy versus other therapies. People might think I've been a bit unfair on manual therapy here because I haven't done manual therapy versus sham, which might be a fairer comparison. But the truth is that um, the manual therapy versus sham uh, comparison is not statistically significant. Uh, CBT versus, versus waiting list controls and his respondent therapy. We have to be a little bit, this is looking a bit more positive, but we have to be a bit cautious. We're looking at two very small trials at risk of bias there. So we can have a look at CRPS. We recently did an overview of systematic reviews of all trials of all interventions for CRPS. I don't recommend doing that. Um, and the results that we found, the only real evidence for, uh, for, for interventions that looked positive, uh, bisphosphonates versus placebo. So there's a handful of small trials that delivered bisphosphonates in uh, different ways, different drug agents as well, and they're demonstrating a, a moderately important benefit. Um, ketamine infusions, that's daily intravenous infusion of ketamine, um, seem to come up to a, a moderately important effect. And graded motor imagery versus usual care, met our threshold for minimal clinically importance, but not moderate clinically important, clinical importance. Um, and across other conditions here, we have exercise therapy for neck pain, CPT versus usual care for, for chronic pain. This is transcranial magnetic stimulation versus sham, okay? <laughs> I don't want to dwell on them for too long, but the message here is that we have to reflect that it's not easy to get into the green. I was really worried about this slide because I suddenly thought, well, what if the Muppet Show didn't come to Spain and no one knew who Kermit the Frog was? So I tweeted, do, do any Spanish people know who Kermit the Frog? And everyone said no. And then someone went, it's La Rana Gustavo. And I said, ah, oh, I'll keep the slide. I'll keep the slide. But <laughs> we are... Um, we're looking at average between group effects here, okay, which, which aren't particularly meaningful always, even though they are the effect of a treatment. Because with some drugs and some interventions, it's been shown that response is bimodal. And what that means is a few people will do very well, a lot of people will get no effect or minimal effect, and there's not many people in the middle. And the problem with that is, that means that our between group average, the mean change, actually is the number that reflects the fewest people in the trial. It's the effect size that fewest people got. Okay, so the solution to this is responder analysis. And a responder analysis, what we do is we measure baseline and we set our threshold, so it might be a 50% change in pain, or a 30% change in pain, and we count the number of people who achieve that threshold, and they're responders, yeah? And people who don't are non-responders. Um, and what we do is we compare the probability of being a responder between the two groups. 
And from that, we can, we can derive things like the number needed to treat. People might be familiar with the number needed to treat statistic. It's a way of working out how many more people you would want to treat, have to treat with that agent or intervention for one more person to have a response, okay? But respond to analysis is itself a bit dodgy. It's a bit limited, right? Because as we've already seen, this might not be response. We would imagine or interpret response meaning someone got better because of the treatment. But actually, a lot of people who respond may not have responded to the treatment. So it's seriously imprecise because you misclassify an awful lot of people as responders who would have got better anyway. So it's also a misnomer for, the, for that reason, that many of these people are not actually responding to treatment. They are simply getting better. So it's very imprecise. The other thing it does is it only focuses on positive change. So we only characterize people by the fact that their pain moves in the direction that we want. So it ignores people who deteriorate. They're just non-responders. But actually, it might be worse than that. They might not just be non-responders. And uh, it doesn't tell us about the people who may have deteriorated had it not been for the treatment. So you may have someone whose natural cause was to get substantially worse, and the treatment may have moderated that process, but we wouldn't measure it in a responder analysis. Okay. And this is the problem that I've just been talking about. Are anyone familiar with this graph? This graph is from a fantastic systematic review by Majid Artus at Kiel, where they took loads of trials of any intervention for back pain and randomly selected a treatment arm and just plotted the course of symptoms over time in that one treatment arm. So in this graph, we have data from manual therapy, exercise, surgery, and importantly, no treatment and placebo, usual care, waiting list controls. And what you see is that the probability of being a responder seems pretty high, right? Regardless of whether you've actually received a treatment or responded to a treatment. And that's one of the big problems of the responder analysis. This graph shows us that it must be imprecise. Um, but the number needed to treat is a useful statistic because it's very understandable to people. Okay? So we have almost no number needed to treat data in physical therapy. There's a few trials, but not many. So I've taken these from, um, from some of the drug data. So the number needed to treat for gabapentin in peripheral neuro diabetic neuropathy is six. Okay, um, pregabalin in post-hepatic neuralgia, it here says uh, 5.3 or 4, but I went to a presentation last week where they've managed to get hold of unpublished data for pregabalin, and now it looks like 8. Think about what that means for a minute, though. What that means is I would have to deliver pregabalin to 8 more people for one to achieve, one more to achieve a minimal important benefit. And the fun thing about pain is our expectations are now so low that you'll often see people say, isn't that a fantastic number needed to treat of six? But think about what it means. What it means is we can only expect a specific treatment response with these drug agents in a small minority of the people that we give them to. And I think that's quite sobering. So Andrew Moore at Cochrane Pain Group recently published a paper called Expect Failure. Pursue success. And the point they were making is, with drugs, we don't know what drug works for what person, and we don't have really great ways of identifying before we deliver a drug. But if we know that the, the, big, the biggest probability is the patient will not be a responder, then we can be very mindful of that. We can watch for it, and we can switch. Because with drugs, if you're going to get a response, it comes quickly. So if we, if we recognize failure and switch to another agent, we maximize the opportunity of getting patient onto a drug that might benefit them. And we minimize the risks of patient being on these drugs, which all confer substantial risk of adverse events. Okay? And my question for you guys, and I don't know the answer, is could we uh, apply the same model in physical therapy? We have this smorgasbord of different treatments, okay, and we don't really have a way of reliably subgrouping people before we've tried them. So should we be doing that? Should we be looking for the failure of a specific approach and constantly switching? 
I think there's a definite potential positive to that, but I think there's also a danger of just pushing patients through a perpetual mill of therapies. And, and, and I think, who was it yesterday? Um, uh, actually, it was one of my, my favorite line from yesterday, is every previous therapist is a potential yellow flag. So just a magnificent line. Um, I think every failed therapy is a potential yellow flag, so we have to be careful. Okay. Of course, trials are not popular things, generally, um, and you, if you go to any physio conference, not this one yet, I know, but most, you'll hear the same arguments that trials, they're great for the drug world, but they don't really work in therapy because therapy is complex. Um, that they apply this one-size-fits-all treatment to a group of people who need their treatment to be individualized and tailored, that perhaps the real world is too noisy for us to really measure the real benefit of our, of our effects. And, and none of those are inherently wrong. The subgroup question is interesting because with a couple of notable exploratory exceptions, we still don't have good evidence that we can subgroup patients and, and achieve better outcomes that way with back pain particularly. Um, the the one-size-fits-all argument is true of some trials, but I think it's an unfair characterization of many modern trials where therapists are actually given quite a lot of freedom to individualize and tailor their treatment depending on the patient in front of them within a, a given theoretical model. The idea that the real world is too noisy for us to really measure in trials the benefit of our treatment, this is not a good argument because, you know, that noise is the real world. And if our treatments are going to work, then they need to be demonstrated to work. We need to be able to measure the signal through that noise. None of us deliver care in a soundproof room, right? Patients have lives, chronic pain patients have particularly difficult, often messy lives. But if we're going to prove that we help people, then we need to do it consistently in trials with that noise. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. OK. So maybe trials do underestimate the true effectiveness of physiotherapy, but the arguments you hear less often in conferences are the fact that the majority of RCTs in chronic pain and the therapies contain biases that broadly favor the therapy that we're testing, that might actually exaggerate therapeutic effects. And unlike the subgroup questions, uh, arguments that I showed you earlier, these ones, uh, they're not speculative. They're well demonstrated. We have hard evidence. Some of you might be familiar with the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment, or perhaps Pedro and the Pedro tool. There's lots of different tools for assessing the quality or risk of bias of an RCT, and they're all much the same. Um, so we look to see whether there's good randomization, okay, whether random allocation was concealed from the person recruiting the patients, whether there was blinding, which is, of course, impossible to achieve uh, for the therapist and the patient in many of our interventions whether there was selective outcome reporting, and whether they dealt properly with dropouts and attrition. Now, let's take a few of those. Uh, an unclear description of how a study was randomized or not randomized in a study is associated with inflated effect sizes of 25%. Um, not reporting allocation concealment is associated with an increase of effect size of 31%. And blinding with a subjective outcome like pain is likely to inflate effect sizes by around 25%. Think about that. We can't blind our trials. So actually, all of these things work in favor of our, of our trials showing that our treatments are perhaps better than they truly are. Okay? Are things improving with the quality of our trials? Well, there are some data. These are Sidney Rubenstein's group who do the Cochrane reviews on manual therapy. Uh, these, these are the average quality scores for manipulative therapy trials. There's a definite improvement in the last two decades, um, but kind of flatlined around moderate quality trials in, in manual therapy. Part of that is because of the blinding problem. Um, this looks across therapy trials a bit more broadly. Uh, Anne Mosley's group from uh, from Pedro, and again, we see trials are definitely improving, but still floating around the sort of moderate quality on average. So they're the things that you already know about. I, I, haven't, I haven't told you anything you didn't know about, I, I think, about what makes a good or a bad trial. But there are some other factors, actually, that affect 
effect sizes and whether we should trust them. So, you know, size matters. It matters, okay? So, this is a lovely plot from an ex-colleague of mine, Dries Hettinger, who did a systematic review of exercise in persistent back pain. And, oh, hello, sorry. And uh, what we have here is the number of participants in the exercise group. And what we have up here is the effect size, the difference in pain, okay? And what you can see, obviously, small studies are much less precise. Thank you. Um, but there's a much higher chance of a very big effect size in a small study. And as the studies get bigger, so the effect sizes cluster around, around much smaller values. And this isn't just in, in exercise for back pain. This is across all interventions. Small studies, even though they shouldn't be powered to detect a positive change, often report an exaggerated change. Partly because small studies that don't find a positive effect never get published. Editors don't like to publish them because they're not very interesting to editors. And people don't like to publish them because they're disappointed about it and they know that their peers won't get excited about it. How we manage dropout in trials is another potential problem. If you have patients come into a clinical trial, it's very, very rare that no one drops out. And we should be suspicious, really, of trials where no one drops out. There's a recent trial of bracing for back pain of 600 people followed over nine years that reports no dropout at all. Make of that what you will. Um, what we look for in terms of an analysis for dropout is what we call an intention to treat analysis. And that's where people are analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized. They, we don't lose them if they drop out or don't comply with the treatment, as that's the most robust way to look at it. But one of the commonest ways of doing that is last observation carried forward. You take the last measure of that person before they withdrew from the trial, and you impute that into all their missing data. But the problem is people withdraw from the trial after they get worse, or after they realize that it isn't helping, or after they have an adverse event. So by taking the, me the measure that came before that, we actually underestimate the risk of the treatment and we overestimate the effectiveness of the treatment. So we're much better taking a more conservative approach. So if you see last observation carried forward, that in itself is a risk of bias. And beyond the methods and the rigor of a trial comes down to this big human problem that ultimately we're all really bad at being objective and honest with ourselves, with other people, okay? And our careers are incentivized that we need to make our results more interesting. And researchers spin. We have hard evidence that researchers spin their data so that it, they make more of it than the data really allow them to. So Boutron found evidence of spin, which is things like claiming that the treatment was effective even though the analysis doesn't really show that, okay? They found spin in more than one section, in 40% of negative randomized trials, trials that showed the treatment wasn't effective. In rheumatology, 23% of trials reviewed were judged as having misleading conclusions in the abstract. Misleading conclusions. And the biggest predictor of misleading conclusions was a negative result. So it isn't just that um, people don't like to publish negative results. It's that people don't even like to admit that they are negative when they're writing the study up. This is a bias, I think, that's just very human. We all do it, but we need to be aware of it. Okay? It's a shame I'm not going to have time to do the honesty test, because what I was going to ask you all is when you read a research paper, which bit do you read? And I do this with my students, and I say, who reads the abstract? And everyone puts their hand up. And I said, who reads all of the abstract? And then half the hands go down. And I said, well, which bit of the abstract do you read? And they read the conclusion. Who reads the introduction? Who reads the discussion? Some people do. That's the interesting bit. Who reads the methods and results in detail? No one. No one. But actually, that's the only part of the paper where you've got a chance of getting at the unfettered truth. Yeah. You've all got to read the methods and the abstracts. So just to sort of finish up, I want to give you a few, I want to take you on a, a bit of a rogues gallery, a tour of all the ways people cheat when they do their trials. Things for you to look out for. The surrogate outcome gamble. You didn't find a change on your clinical primary outcome, but if you dig hard enough, you'll find a change in something that you can wave about. So with this one, it would be like, my core stability trial didn't really make people's back pain better 
but their transversus abdominis is really coming on faster than it was before, that's a positive result. Of course, the patient doesn't feel better. So you pick a surrogate outcome. In neurophysiology, we might do our fancy trials with fMRI. The patients weren't better, but their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex looks a bit juicier, you know, with gray matter. So we've got to watch for the surrogate outcome, okay? Post hoc subgroup hunting, going through your data after the fact, trying to look for reasons of the groups of people that really did respond. I've already shown you that you can't actually tell who responded, you can only tell who got better, right? And it's a really, uh, it's a really un robust thing to do. And some statisticians a few years back in cardiology uh, had a bit of fun with that and managed to prove that uh, a, a cardiac drug was specifically effective in Scorpios and Sagittarius people. It's very easy to come up with spurious subgroups if you go digging through the data. Um, P-hacking. I've already told you that it's easy to manufacture a p-value. The best way to do it is just to run lots and lots of tests because P may be 0.05, but if I run 10 tests, P equals 0.5, right, overall. And there's lots of ways that you can find a p-value. That's one of the reasons I would like you guys to stop really thinking about p-values and start just looking at the size of the effect. And axis cropping. Does anyone know what I mean by axis cropping? I want to show you some real data from a, a study I reviewed of RTMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation for, for fibromyalgia, I think it was. Anyway, this is the graph that came to us, and it's looking pretty good, I'd say. So this is sham, and this is active brain stimulation, okay? And these are statistically significant, fantastic, and it looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? But do you notice anything? This is a 0 to 10 pain scale, suddenly shrunk down to two and a half points. So I said, I, you know, well done for presenting your results. What I'd quite like you to do with that graph is show us the whole y axis. And now this is the published version of the trial, okay? I mean, it's the same data. What is the reason for cropping an axis to two and a half points, there can only really be one reason, that's to make the effect look bigger than it actually is. Okay. There's a tendency for this to all seem really negative. <laughs> and I get accused of that all the time, so I'm going to try and convince you that it's not. Because it's our responsibility to really test what we do rigorously, okay? I suspect loads of you are here and fascinated in pain because you've come to the conclusion over the years that the old models that you've been taught and the old treatments actually didn't work, right? How do we know they didn't work? Because we did trials, we did systematic reviews, and we tested it rigorously. We have to be prepared to be critical, and we have to be prepared to be rigorous and look for all those biases, all those reasons that we might mislead because there are so many ways we might be misled, and our patients require that of us. Um, when you're looking at a trial, here's the questions I think you should ask yourself if you're thinking about whether the results mean anything to your patients. Is the patient group broadly similar? Yeah? Do, is there a reason to think that they would be different in terms of their response to the people that you see in the clinic? Um, is the intervention appropriate and achievable? Anyone who's tried to implement graded motor imagery in the way that it's described in the original trials in complex regional pain syndrome, where patients were doing it uh, three times every waking hour they were doing these exercises. I'm a physiotherapist and I struggle to get patients to do one static quadriceps contraction once a week. And if I achieve it, often the patient isn't doing it the way that I'd asked them to do it. So we have to think, is the, is the intervention achievable? Is it something we can genuinely apply to practice? The outcomes, are they useful and relevant? You know, we always need to come back to patient-orientated outcomes. Pain, disability, quality of life. The mechanistic stuff is important, but only if it explains the effects that are meaningful to the patients. Do I have enough information? Because in lots of trials, they won't report that information. And unreported information doesn't fall out of reports at random. People tend not to report the bits that they'd rather you didn't read. And how big is the effect? I'm back to that. Is that effect meaningful? I'm going to finish with a couple of quotes. Richard Feynman's my favorite physicist. Everyone should have a favorite physicist. Um, and when the Challenger shuttle disaster occurred, he was brought on to work out what happened. 
help work out. And he got really frustrated at middle managers at NASA who seemed to have this process of ignoring uncomfortable truths and saying, well, you know, that's a negative interpretation of the data. It will probably be okay. And that was about the fuel seal, uh, that, that they, they didn't do full safety testing on the fuel seals. And he said, for any successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations because nature cannot be fooled. That applies just as much to any of our technologies that we apply to the patients. And I think there's a lot to learn from that. And Archie Cochrane, who was the inspiration behind the Cochrane organization, who really learned about whether people get better or whether people don't in prisoner of war camps. Um, and he wrote in a book that I urge you all to read. It's open access. You can get it online. One should be delightfully surprised when any treatment at all is effective and always assume that a treatment is ineffective unless there is good, rigorous evidence to the contrary. I've added the good and rigorous. Yeah? So what I would suggest is we should never stop being rigorous and critical and looking at trials with a really hard lens, but we shouldn't ever stop looking to be delightfully surprised either. And I think that is everything I have to say to you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>